Uh, good evening, sir. Yes, good evening. You are the first person. So I'm just waiting at least. If when two other person comes, I'll begin. I know. I think everybody there is ready to come. Just restart my machine. It take a while. So I think people that are ready. I, I I so agree. Mm -hmm. Have you started looking at your question? Question. Yeah, for the for the for your presentation, have you started looking at it? So hold on, hold on. A question for my presentation. Right. I'm saying, have you started looking at the question? No, sir. You know what I'm, I'm assuming. Saying. Okay, sir. Um, this is on the information. I said would have been on mood, right? Yeah, I told you to take a picture of it, Mario. Didn't you hear that in the class? I don't put it up yet. This course oh. is not going to be on mood because it's an internal course. I have to go put oh, all kinds sir. of things on Canvas. I told, and that was what I said. You didn't hear that part there? Sir, honestly, I'm going to tell you, uh, mon oh, Monday night it was. I mm -hmm. um, know I've been there for a while, and I don't know what happened. The only thing I remember after a little bit is me, I wake up, sir, honestly. That's where did that come from. I'm really kind of. But I really don't remember what happened. I just know so I drop asleep, sir, honestly. So I'm really sorry about that. All right, let me find um, the. Let me find the tutorial. Um, but I am supposed to build it up, but I am so busy with doing so many different things. Of course, we're. Um, so, boy, these days, I'm tired enough because I literally just I come from where I start work at 6 o'clock this morning. What kind of work? Actually, you drive to come and me. I work at Digital. I'm a customer to your supervisor. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, I'm a drive come and sit near me. just reach home. And I tune in our class now. I will probably get up and walk when I drop asleep, but my day is still. Right. So, are you seeing your name here, Maurice Fowler? It is. Which oh, was... oh. Yeah, I'm seeing. So it's it's the one with, um to work with Maurice Fowler. No, no. Where's your name? Is your name on the list? No, I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing my name there, no sir. Because when I was calling you, you never said anything. Uh, Oh, see, boy, I figure, I figure, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was listening to the first, I'm recording of the first class that they put up, the one that I wasn't here. I remember you saying something about this was supposed to work, like, you know, in peers. Um, to the scripture, the scripture, the international scripture is on the shoulder. So you, I think Maurice is the only one doing this question, so you probably can work with Maurice because everybody else has. Yes, sir, I will. I'll do that, sir. Um, Remind me of your name? Oh, Mario Bailey. Remember, you're working together now. You're not doing separate questions. You're not doing separate okay, presentations. Sir. All right. So you're going to either choose the descriptive. So choose any two. No, you should, should choose any one, not two. Choose any one. Oh, any one. Right. Either descriptive of international trade theories and show how they can explain the growth of international trade. Okay. Is there anything specific that you um? Um, no, usually what happens is no, I'm gonna teach you before you got, you have the presentation. Okay, okay, sir. Okay. Okay, so it's not you're not going to do it in the fly. You're going to there's going to be a discussion about it. Okay, gotcha, sir. Gotcha. I'm mean, just going to some reading at the meantime. Right. So all you need to do is in, in doing some you can watch some YouTube videos that can give you some basic understanding and then you start doing the reading after. So that when you start yeah, man, after the reading, you you know what is um happening. <laughs> Yes, sir. I start. I started to the circle uh, when I was listening to the first class. You know, my area and the old PDF thing, and you know, so I decided to make sure some. You know, I start to look up. You mean YouTube they, they and all to, to, to cite sources and all of that about turning it in and citing. Yeah, you know, we, we use. 
we used to the PDF thing, you know, sir. So, you know, we get the notes and thing, but I hear you, boy, you know, you know, no, send no. the PDF notes and all no, them no, things. No, so. Yeah, like so. <laughs> but I did send, though, you know, I said, I sent unit one already and I sent unit two. I sent it already to you guys. In the e you, you didn't get it? Yeah, man, I saw the email, sir. I saw the email. Right. So, yeah, you man, have so. unit one and unit two. Yeah, so I, start, I started doing like a reading still and I was listening to some videos on the way home while I was driving up. So um, trying to get, just trying to catch up, you know? Okay. I'll, I'll make a check and see where the others are, sir. One okay. Second. All right. Make a, let me make a few calls. All right, I'm seeing uh, uh, Christopher, Mario, and Shani. Good evening, everybody. It would be good if you can actually say something. Good evening, sir. Yes. All right, so today uh, we're going to look, we're going to continue our discussion about globalization, multinational corporations, as well as foreign direct investment. And I'm going to Today, we're going to have a conversation, no PowerPoint, all right? So somewhat of a dictation. If you want to write, you write. If you don't want to write, that's on you. But we're going to have a conversation. I'm not going to share any screen. I might, in terms of PowerPoint, but I might uh, share, play a video or two so, so that we can have a more meaningful conversation and that you can actually write notes because writing helps you to remember information, all right? So let's start off by having a conversation about globalization. And I want for you to think of globalization, um, foreign direct investment, and multinational corporations as, a, as, as the, three, um, the three musketeers, quote unquote. So it was, it was really international trade that led to the 
globalization of the world or the world becoming a, a, a single space or the world becoming a, a quote unquote global village. Whenever you're writing about globalization, it's very, very fundamental that you include the word integration. So any definition of globalization must have the word in it, integration. Because globalization really is the integration of cultures, the integration of economies, the, e the integration of political systems, the integration of services, and I think I mentioned economies. So it's very important that when you're talking about globalization, you have at the core um, the word integration. Other terms that indicate globalization or should also be included in a definition of, of globalization is interdependence. In other words, the countries have become interdependent. They now have to rely on each other for survival, quote unquote, or the economies of member states have to rely on each, on, on one another to survive. And this is why we have, for example, international organizations such as the World Health Organization, because it says world health. In other words, they are supposed to be carrying out research and also responding to pandemics. We have the World Trade Organization. In other words, they are going to regulate world trade, quote unquote. So there's an interdependence, um, there's an integration, and there's interconnectivity or interconnection of these key players, the political, the sociocultural, the financial, the cultural. And because of the interdependence, because of the interconnection, because of the integration, these no transcend borders. And when I say borders, I'm talking about national borders. So to some extent, globalization is about making states, individual states, borderless, making them more accessible. And we're going to get into a discussion now about how, for example, globalization kind of laid the foundation for modern what is called the modern um, version or the mod modern form of multinational corporations. And it is the multinational corporations in many instances that is facilitating or that is doing foreign direct investment across the world. So I want for you to think about it that way. And, and for the persons who are going to actually answer number two, that's how you're going to look at it. So globalization does not you can't put globalization in a box uh, by itself and multinational corporations in a box by themselves and also foreign direct investment because it is really all of these things are playing out together or is um or are facilitated by each other can you mute your mic please Miss Nisha Headlam, can you mute, mute your mic, please? Yes, that's a question. All right, hold on. Let me just clean host and mute everybody because I'm not sure why she would unmute. Everybody got what I was saying earlier? And remember, I told you, you have to be taking your own notes now because I'm dictating. So you're kind of scribbling down what you understand. There is no PowerPoint presentation today. It's going to be a conversation. Because of the interdependence, the interconnectivity, and the integration of the world economies, this led to a rise, especially after World War II, to the proliferation of international businesses. So countries know that originally did not interact with one another, were now given 
the opportunity to do so. So international businesses were all over the place. Globalization also should be thought of as a way of how that should be thought of as a process that led to the that led to an increased integration of markets. And when we're talking about markets, we're talking about the exchange of goods and services, etc. Globalization or the interaction or the interconnectivity or the interconnection countries of member states with one another also led to the internationalization of travel, transportation, communication, and cultures. So I think I had mentioned in the lecture before about the Industrial Revolution and how the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century led to the revolution of transportation and communication. It means that certain goods or certain products could now be transported from one destination to another within a short shorter period of time. Originally, they were doing the transportation by way of ships, and we will get into a discussion about that and how even colonialism, um, the, the, the way in which colonialism is a part of the conversation about globalization and about multinational corporations investing in colonies. And it is a form of foreign direct investment. When you're having a conversation, if, if you're given a question about globalization, the history of, you don't necessarily have to go all the way back to 16th and 18th century, although you could. You can begin your conversation about it right after World War II, when it became, when globalization became more pronounced and that led to a proliferation of multinational corporations doing foreign direct investments in various countries, especially in developing countries. Am I making sense? Can somebody just say, am I making sense? Because I'll get all academic and get all excited. Um, and I don't want to lose anybody. So just talk to me. And do we understand? I'm following for the most part, sir. Okay. Christopher, what about you? Everything is okay? Yes, sir. All right. So, I want for you to also think about globalization as... A process by which various production chains, or I would call them production clusters, were created across the world. Various production chains or various production clusters were created across the world. And what do I mean by that? There are many companies, I think Volkswagen is one of them, that and let me see if I can find, uh, I think Volkswagen, Volkswagen, I don't want to get it. Uh, I think Volkswagen. Okay. Let's just a, 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 a quick clip just to demonstrate that point about how globalization has facilitated or led to the product uh, to the creation of production chains around the world. Volkswagen. Pretty much everyone on the planet knows that name. But the thing is, this company is a bit of a dark horse. They actually own a lot of car brands which you've heard of. In fact, every fourth car sold in Europe is from the Volkswagen Group. Volkswagen has been a popular suggestion for a video, so let's do it. In this video, we'll talk about the intriguing origins, size, and some interesting facts about VW. Volkswagen, translated from German to English, means the people's car. 
And that's exactly what the company was created for back in 1937, to make a car for the people of Germany. In order to understand and really appreciate the history of VW, we must look at where it all started, with a man named Ferdinand and a car called the Beetle. The Beetle was the brainchild of Ferdinand Porsche, who was the son of a master panel beater. Porsche was born in 1875 in northern Bohemia, all modern day Czech Republic. From a young age, he was a non-conformist and a free thinker, but possessed a brilliant mind for design for Austria I during World War I. I just want to get a little bit to what, not necessarily just to the history, but the various, let me see if it comes. Germany went into full crisis mode and diverted all attention towards the war right, effort. That, that's, this is World the, War I. At this time, the situation in Germany was dire and some citizens were even on the brink of starvation. What I want you to understand is how globalization led to a proliferation of a, of, of a multinational corporation such as Volkswagen in the 20th century. In 1950, Ferdinand took one last tour of the factory and was happy to finally see his vision being realized. He would die one year later at the age of 75. The early success of the Beetle was limited only to Europe. In America, the car was a hard sell. Large, powerful cars were the staple of what 1950s America stood for. As after wind currents across the world. For example, the Polo is named after the Northern Polar Wind. The Passat is named after a German trade wind. The Jetta is named after the jet stream in subtropic to middle latitudes. Number three. Three Volkswagen cars were named in the list of the top 10 best-selling cars ever. The Volkswagen Passat, Golf, and Beetle. Number two, right. an entire- so, I, so my point is that to, if you're having a conversation about globalization, the history of globalization, um, and I would say the modern history of globalization, you will have to talk about multinational corporations and foreign direct investments. But how to do that? You can look at it through the lens of, of, a, of a particular um, company such as Volkswagen. So there are various global production chains facilitated by globalization, which again, I go back to the whole notion of interdependence, interconnectivity, and integration, where in most instances, the, the headquarters for the company is either in the UK, Europe, United States, or Canada, but various parts of, uh, 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 for example, Volkswagen, they're made all over the world. I'm sure Volkswagen are in Jamaica, they're all over. So I want for you to understand it within that particular, um, within that framework. So prior to the 19th century now, prior to the 19th century, India and China were the world's two most dominant economies. And I'm sure some persons would not um, necessarily know this, that India and China were actually participating in international trade prior to the 19th century. But after World War II, after World War II, which is the 20th century, I'm not sure how many people know, um, do you know when World War II ended? When was, or what's the time period for World War II? You can Google and tell me. Because again, any conversation about globalization has to include or has to mention World War II because several things happen um, after World War II. I am listening. Time period for World War II or time period of World War II. I am listening. Per? Yes. It was between September 1939 to September 1st to September 2nd, 1945. Right. So it was between 39 to 
1945, sorry, my, my apologies. And what happened is that after World War II, many, the world itself lost millions of people and the, the, the world's economies were ravished. So countries were like, oh darn, what did we do? You know, we can't feed our people, we can't manage, we can't help others in need. And this led now to the development of several multilateral organizations. And this is an important point that you must make note of, that after World War II, several multilateral organizations came to the fore to ensure that there is never a repeat of World War II. Also to Britain or the British monarch realized that because their economies were so ravished, it would make economic sense to grant independence to country to their colonies. Let's not, let's not just say the Caribbean, to grant independence to their colonies. So there was a proliferation of independence during the 1960s. So Jamaica, we got independence in 1962. And if you look at the other countries, some countries got it in the same year in the Caribbean or during that period of time. When you also look at, I don't know if you know this, that the reason you have countries, like, you know, you have countries with two different, like there are two countries combined in the Caribbean, like Trinidad and Tobago. The reason for that is when independence was, was being granted, the countries were too small. So they had to join them. So Trinidad and Tobago was, Trinidad and Tobago are literally two different countries joined in one because of population, because of population size. And if you, I don't know how many people have actually traveled, you find that there's a tension between Trinidad and Tobago. Sometimes the people on Trinidad, the island of Trinidad, don't like the people on, the, on Tobago and vice versa. So again, globalization, um, yeah, you have to be globalization kind of facilitated these kinds of things. Some people actually argue that international trade preceded globalization because globalization is not just international trade, it's much more, or it morphed into much more. So we're talking about the rise of several multilateral organizations such as the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and the World Trade Organization. And these particular um, international organizations were set up to not only prevent World War II, but to facilitate international trade and to set up rules. Because if we're going to, if we're going to trade between and among um, economies, there, you must have certain quote unquote international laws, or there must be some rules governing how things are done. So what I'm speaking about is in a very contemporary way, you know, the international trade or globalization. And there's something called economic globalization. So there are different manifestations of globalization. So we are really talking about economic globalization. So we go all the way back, because I, I was just talking about the 20th century, but we go all the way back to AD 1000 to AD 1500. And I'm going to put that timeline in the chat. AD 1000 to AD 1500 to the city of Venice, where they were actually trading within Europe and in the Mediterranean. They were trading high value spices and silks to Europe, and they were also transferring knowledge from Asia, Egypt, and other countries. In the 16th century, Portugal kind of surpassed Venice and were now transporting spices to Europe. And you're going to also find that in this, in, in this notion of international trade, what was really happening, what a part of what was happening too was that multinational corporations or corporations as they were called at the time, they too were participating in these voyages or in, let's call them voyages, in these what I call discoveries. Because when ships 
we're going to we're, we're we're going all over the world on behalf of the monarch in search of resources and all of that you had corporations that had to be what repairing the ships corporations actually had to repair the ships so you find that the historical a, a historical understanding of globalization is important to add to a contemporary understanding of globalization because globalization historically from AD 1000 to AD 1500 was in part based on international trade of high value goods such as spices and silks. You also had the corporation playing a fundamental role in terms of transportation by sea. They had they were responsible for repairing ships and making the various parts for ships. And I'm going to get into a discussion about how India played a fundamental role in that. Making sense, everybody? Talk to me. Making sense? Making sense? So far, sir. OK. Wayne Barnes, I don't think I've ever called your name in the class. Are you new to the class? The name seems new to me. I don't remember ever seeing that name. Mr. Barnes? Sir? Are you new to the class? Yes. No. You were at the last class? No, I wasn't at the last class. I was at the class before that. OK. All right, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to ask you if you selected a, a question. Or a question. I'm, I'm supposed to put it on. Uh, number one, we're going to again go back to number one today because we started the discussion on Monday. All the tutorial questions are done on Wednesdays. And well, I'm going to leave some time for us to have a more full some discussion about it to kind of demonstrate to other persons what is it that I'm looking for. So there are five questions. Number one is out. Because at the time I had, um, so it seems as if what I'm going to have to do is to split this question. All right, so split this question into, all right. So no, all right, let's go back. Or, and what I'm going to do, so this part, copy. Okay. This thing is supposed to change to six. What is wrong with you? Thank you. Right, to choose. Okay. Prescriptive. No, I should really give them prescriptive. Give them. All right, descriptive. Descriptive. No, this still makes sense. Oh yeah, yeah, it's fair. It's because oh. Okay. okay, and choose this part. Okay. All right, give me one sec, guys. I'm just because uh, I can't have so many different persons in one person. So one is going to do descriptive, and the other is going to in the same week. What's your name, the person who just joined us? Um, I just called your name. Wayne. Wayne Barnes, okay. Wayne Barnes, okay. All right, Mr. Barnes, you are going to go in this week. Let's change this to black. Let's change this to yellow. All right, so if anybody else comes, you will have somebody to work with. All right, let me just tidy the question because this is so and show how they explain. So, what's this 
possible in this particular dimension of the rules. So this is this was So this was how descriptive international theory, trade theories explain the growth of international trade. This was how prescriptive international trade explain the growth of international trade. Yeah, that can work. All right, so. Sorry, it's not 39 in that, in that 39 days in a long month. Say that again? It's not 39 days. Oh, I think this is 30. It should be 30, probably. Thanks for that. It should be 30. All right. Everybody seeing his or her name now for presentation? No, sir. Uh, are you new to the class? I was in the last class up to a point. Okay, so you're going to do this one with Wayne, okay? What's your name? Misha Hedlam Robinson. M-E-I-S-H-A? N-E-S-H-A. Uh-huh. N as in Nancy. This is your, this is N? N as in Nancy for Nisha. Oh, it's me. Oh, I thought you said me. Uh-huh. Hedlam? Robinson. Hyphenated, oh. your hyphenated name? Yes. This is it, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So you both are you going to work together. So remember, you're not doing different papers. You're doing one presentation together and one paper together. Okay. So you're going to work together on the same question. All right. Um, and as I said to persons before, all right. So how this works is that don't think that you're going to, you're, I'm going to throw you at sea in terms of the discussion. You are going to be the, the tutorials are ahead of the, the lectures are ahead of the tutorials. In other words, we will have a discussion on your subject area before you actually do the presentation. So you'll get an understanding of what it is about. And also, um, so you can be better prepared. What I suggest, I, what I always suggest to students and what I did when I was an undergraduate is that even when my lecturer has not reached that topic, I kind of start doing my own little work, kind of, you know, looking up the topics, trying to understand, trying to answer the question, even to have a draft and take it to my lecturer and say, oh, I'm sir, can you look at this for me? Am I on the right track? I kind of write my thesis statement to ensure that, you know, everything is okay. All right, so I recommend that you guys do this and everybody knows working with somebody. Is there anybody else without a question? So please remember now, if you don't come for your presentation, I will give you zero. I could care less if you're lying and I'm dead serious. You're not going to give me any cock and bull story. I'm not into it. There are adults. Every year, students give all this kind of strange. Anytime they have work to do, they have all kinds of things. Internet not working. I don't care because I'm not giving you another presentation. So let me tell you. All right. So ensure you are. And, and especially, this is another reason I have paired you up. Sir, if one person can go. I'm listening. Go ahead. You said somebody said, sir, go ahead. Sir, I'm saying it's not every group is the same. Teachers never normally have problems with our group, sir. So you don't have Wonderful. to thing over and over. No, no, I have, I have to stress it because I don't know I, I don't know you, but I'm happy you said that. So I will not mention it anymore because I'm dealing with a group that is very, very productive. Wonderful. All right, so I'm going to upload this document to... Um, Canvas, I'm realizing that this is not a triple CJ, triple CJ course. It is a, it is a internal course. I'm going to upload the document to, to, um, to Canvas. What I suggest you do, however, is just to take a picture of the screen or of your question, and you and your partner start having a conversation about how you want to approach a question. And if you want to um, talk to me after class on Wednesday, like if you have any ideas that you think you want to discuss or any example, you can say, sir, after class, I want to talk to you. All right. I will wait after the class ends at nine o'clock and for another half hour or 45 minutes to assist you. Okay. I don't have a problem doing that. Any questions relating to this? And we're going to have some time to talk about the tutorial question again and the approach and all of that. All right. 
So I'm going to stop sharing screen. All right, so I go back to the lecture now. Can anybody, anybody remember what was the last thing I mentioned? What was I talking about, the last thing I mentioned? No one remembers what I, the last thing I mentioned? Okay. All right, so I'll just go back to, I think I shared in the chat the time Sir, period. So yes. you were talking about the independence. You, you had reached the... the right. Right, so the, I, I think I mentioned the independence of Caribbean states, right? During the 1960s. It is. Right, and how after World War II, because world, the world, um, economies around the world were ravished and they barely had money to help themselves. They established international organizations and also the British monarch or the British empire realized to our, let's just say colonizers realized that uh, it was not, it was no longer profitable in terms of having colonies, not only profitable, but the world had reached a point where they were not accepting this notion of countries being colonized by other countries. So, and then I mentioned too that, and I mentioned in the 16th century now that Portugal surpassed Venice and also was transporting spices to Europe and how some of these particular countries went, went on voyages in search of resources and some people say countries to conquer. All right, and that was a part of the notion of international trade, very much a part of international trade. All right, so I'm just trying to, the other time period, and I'm gonna put the other time period in the chat, and this is just kind of historicizing um, our conversation so that we can understand it in the contemporary, in the 20th century, let me just say that, is the, am I spelling this term right? No. The 16th to 18th century, where India was exporting products to Europe and other nations. And this is an important point to make that in, in during the 16th to 18th century, India was exporting products to Europe and other countries or other nations, and that they had one of the largest shipbuilding industry. They had, India during this time period had one of the largest shipbuilding industries. And therefore, it means that international trade between India and many European countries would have been very high because the European countries were responsible for going around the world, especially in the quote unquote, the modern world or, or in the Western world, finding countries to, to, to colonize and also finding resources um, to colonize. Somebody was saying something? So that's a very important point to make. India was actually one of the most advanced nations before the Industrial Revolution. So India was one of the most advanced nations before the Industrial Revolution. Does anybody know anything about the Industrial Revolution? What was the, when we say Industrial Revolution, what are we talking about? What exactly are we talking about? Industrial revolution. You can Google and talk to me. Sir. Yes. No, no, bad. Foolishness. Is that right? No, just talk how you know it's foolishness and you don't say it. Yes, people talk to me. Industrial revolution, what are we talking about? Is free zone apart? What's a part of the industrial revolution? When you say free zone, what do you mean? Yeah, I remember when we used to have free zone down our walk there. So no man, you and I we were have... you, you and I were not born, no were our parents or grandparents born yeah. during so that period. It started in the 1760s. Right. And um it's really to be with new um processes, manufacturing processes, etc. Right. And, and, so wait um, the, the yes, go ahead. locomotive and you know steam powered locomotives and various um, new technologies basically. Right, right. There you go. Um, so in other words, again the world was going into industrial revolution. Let me just see if I can find a little clip just to show you guys. 
this so that everybody right the that's a small clip of it. No eternity, that's too long. I think this probably can suffice. Yeah. And again, this is another important period in understanding globalization. A special one. So this is a, this is another historical free. period. Immersive training I'm doing with in the life of you see who's coming globalization. Industrial Revolution, 18th to 19th century. The economic developments of the 1800s saw the development of agrarian and handicraft economies in Europe and America transform into industrial urbanized ones. The term to describe this phenomenon would be known as the Industrial Revolution and was first used by French writers but made popular by English economic historian Arnold Toynbee. The Industrial Revolution was underpinned by the Agricultural Revolution. From the mid-18th century to the mid-19th century, agricultural production increased significantly. The huge increase in food output supported the expansion and sustained a large population and boosted trade. The increased use of machines over human or animal power in farming also meant that less farm workers were needed and they could leave the land to industrial towns. Better metals and richer fuel also contributed to industrialization by creating the steam engine, an integral machine to industrialization which powered factories, locomotives and ships. The new steam engines used coal and iron, both in their construction and as fuel, increasing demand for these resources. Roads, canals and railways changed Britain dramatically, connecting Britain and allowing goods to be sent over long distances. Visually, the revolution was clear in the new industrial towns, with smoking factories dominating the skyline. The cities were horrible to live in, overcrowded and dirty with dangerous conditions in the factories and strict rules and punishments. The Industrial Revolution saw mechanization in factories of the textile industry, which was previously manufactured in the home, creating the term cottage industry. Now, production could be increased on a large scale because of new inventions such as the spinning mule and the power loom. The iron industry developed with Henry Bessemer's inexpensive process for mass producing steel. Iron and steel were key materials for constructing the tools and machinery, steam engines and ships needed for the industrial progress. Industrial labor opportunities drew people to the cities from the countryside to such an extent that in 1750 only 15% of the population of Britain lived in towns. By 1850, over 50% of the entire population of Great Britain lived in either a town or a city, and by 1900 it was 85%. London had 4.5 million people. Glasgow? Alright, so one of the things you're seeing now is with the, with, the, with, the, with the Industrial Revolution is mass production and you're also seeing mechanization. In other words, societies were being transformed and it therefore means that you could, you could get, because of the kinds of technologies that were taking place, um, not, not technologies that were taking place, that existed at the time, there was an opportunity you now to mass produce and to sell globally. So, again, the Industrial Revolution transformed international trade because more goods and services could be produced over a shorter period of time. It also transformed society where from being from, from an agrarian um, one into a, a, a quote unquote into an urban one. It also had, um, it affected um, geography or uh, let's call it, let's call it, um, where people live. I, I'm, I'm trying to think of the term in my head, but it's not coming to me, no. In other words, persons move from I, rural not, areas, no. they move from rural areas now living near to factories because it, the Industrial Revolution led to a proliferation of factories. The other period I want you to think about as well is the is 1870 to 1914. And this is pre-World War One. Let me just put pre-World War One. And again, there was a large scale, or there was large amount of 
integration of economies in terms of trade flows, movement of capital, and migration of people. In other words, people, you know, the world was, people were doing businesses with each other. The world was in peace, so nobody, you know, really had an issue. Um, countries never had an issue trading with one another, especially it's coming right out of the, right after the industrial revolution or that period that led to the different kinds of technologies that existed in terms of transportation, in terms of mechanization, in terms of mass production. It is considered a period too, this is pre-World War I, where globalization became more pronounced because it was, and this was led by transportation and, and communication. And I think we did talk about it in our previous lecture, but as I said, I wanted, I want to give you a kind of overarch, overarching understanding of globalization, multinational corporations, and foreign direct investments. And I, and I said before that it is the multinational corporations that really do the foreign direct investment. All right. And that if you're answering a question about the history of globalization, or the history of multinational corporations or the history of FDIs, that still you still have to have a conversation about globalization because historically globalization at that time or originally meant international trade. But no, it's not just of trade, but of political systems, of economies, of cultures, and of peoples. And the word peoples is a correct, is grammatically correct. So think about it that way. And then you all you have to do now is to look at the various kinds of examples that you can use to show how um, globalization provides an understanding of international trade or international business, international businesses and how they operate in the 20th century. Uh, give me one second, my principal is calling me. Yes, my apologies. So we are saying that pre-World War One, there is an there is a there's large scale integration of economies, movement of capital, which means foreign direct investment. It could mean foreign direct investment, because capital means that the capital is moving from its money or investment moving from one country into another. It probably relatively, it doesn't necessarily have to mean foreign direct investment, not necessarily so, but it could mean that, um, as well as the migration of people. 
and that this period is considered um, a time when globalization became more pronounced led by transportation and communication. The other time period I wanted to think about is World War between World War I and World War II. Do you think the same thing, the, the whole integration of economies and movement of people and movement of capital was also taking place between World War I and World War when during the period of World War I and World War II? Do you think that was still happening? It's not a rhetorical question, people. Hello? I have not. Sir? Yes? Where are, where, where, where are the but it right. must be between World War I and World War II, if it was the same thing that caused the war? No. So what I'm saying, it? so so pre-World War I, that 1870 to 1914, I put the time period in the chat, mm -hmm. there was a there was there was the integration of economies, there was the movement of people, there was the movement of capital. And I'm yeah. asking now, do you think that the same thing was happening during the period of World War I to World War II? Do you think that there was the integration of economies, there was the movement of capital and were people migrating? Yes, sir. During a world war? Yeah, where I asked me, say, I asked for the same thing happened. So if it happened in a world war, what if I that caused world war one? Obviously to me, I that that caused world war two. You're not listening. I never said it caused anything. Listen to what I said. I never said cause. What I are said, you asking if, if the people ended up move up and down during a world war? All right, can you listen, please? again are you seeing the thing in the chat are you seeing the time period in the chat i think i think there's a pause on trade and all that during that period there has to be a pause on trade because you're fighting the world is warring with itself quote unquote and usually all those factories were, were, were turning to um to make equipment for the war like machinery exactly uh, exactly and so, and so, on. so in other words that period during that period there was a pause on globalization Fair enough, Raman. There was a pause because the economies were not integrating. Capital was not moving about. People were not allowed to migrate because, and the whole mass production, um, the proliferation of products and all of that um, would have paused. And as you rightly said, Raman, that they would have converted factories now. These are factories that are coming, partly coming from the industrial revolution when factories became the big thing would have been converted into you know places where you know like outposts military outposts to create to fight either fight the war or create the, 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 the um the the weaponry that is needed to fight in the war and things like that so there would have been a pause on globalization um and the growth and or involvement of mul multinational corporations as well and by and and by extension foreign direct investments but after World War II, and I, I, I've said some of this before, but I'm still going to say it because I want you to understand it. Um, the world realized that it made a big mistake in terms of getting into a second world war and therefore decided to set up several international bodies. And also to, it was during this period after World War II into, in the 1960s that many colonies gained their independence, especially in the Caribbean. And globalization or the integration of economies started picking up again because the world trade organization was there now to oh yes was there to remove restrictive barriers because during the war period countries were not interested in trading with trading with each other or trading with one another there were a lot of protection um, what they call protectionist policies put in place in other words import duties were very high we don't want anybody to send anything to our country because we don't know if they're sending things to kill us or whatever so after World War II, um, globalization started picking up. And by 1995, the World Trade Organization was established. And I want again to put that in the chat. WTO established in 1995. Does anybody know anything about the WTO, the World Trade Organization? 
Does anybody know anything about? Sir, they, um, they, they assist with resolving trade disputes. So they assisted, nations. right? So they assist with resolving trade issue, issues between and among nations. And in other words, they set up the rules of engagement and they ensure that countries are playing by the rules. All right, so when you hear Jamaicans complain, why they all love so much banana from America coming to Jamaica? And why they all do this? It's because Jamaica is a member of the World Trade Organization. And you have to, if you say that you're a part of the World Trade Organization, you have to allow free trade. And then let me bring it back to Jamaica. So in the 1970s now, Jamaica embraced uh, many countries in the Caribbean. So you had Cuba, Grenada, Jamaica, I can't remember the other ones. Does anybody know which year, which country was in, which Caribbean country was invaded by the US in the 80s? Does anybody know? Okay. Sir, was it Grenada? It was Grenada. Do you know why they invaded Grenada? Other than um, the lie that they told the public? No, I don't, I don't, I don't know anything, the, the specifics, so I, um, I don't remember the specifics. Okay, fair enough. So, Grenada, so the U.S. said to, said to the world that, oh, we're just invading Grenada because we want to protect American citizens. But the real reason they invaded Grenada in 1982 was because Grenada also embraced what is considered democratic socialism, because during that period of time, you had communists, you had the USSR. And what they had, what, what that was going on was it was called the Cold War. I'm not sure if you've ever heard the term Cold War. And the US, you know that US consider us a part of the Americas. We're a part of the Americas, right? So we are part, we're, we're literally on their doorstep. So they can they, there's this thing called, I'm not sure if you've ever heard about the Monroe Doctrine. I don't want to, as I said, I don't want to get too highfalutin and get too historical. The Monroe Doctrine, where America really says to itself, we're the police of the world. And what they tell themselves is that they have to dictate what happens in other countries. So U.S. is saying, oh, Jamaica does the right down there. So see Miami right here. So we can literally spit at Jamaica. And Jamaica is going to embrace democratic socialism, which is close to Cuba, Cuba's communism. Same thing with Grenada. So what they did, they invaded Grenada. And, I, and I've always said this to people. Had Mr. Siaga not won the 1980s election, they would have invaded Jamaica. And I can tell you too that they, in, um, they fully supported Mr. Siago winning the election. And this is also to where Garrison politics comes from, the whole notion of at that point in time, it was, it was Claude Moss up first, then Jim Brown, after Jim Brown, then Dodos. I'm not sure if you, know, you guys should know about these Eridans and how the CIA sent guns and ships to Jamaica. And that kind of led to the creation of Garrisons as they're taught, um, as they're, they're spoken about. So Tivoli is considered the mother of all garrisons. And then Trenchtown or Arnett Guards, that side, is considered the, the, the child of, of all garrisons because it was kind of a, a, a PNP or a political response to the JLP's um, Tivoli Gardens. So, so all of this is interlocked. Why did they want, um, give me one sec. Morning. Yes. So why did why did America, president at the time was Ronald Reagan, Prince, Prime Minister of, 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 of um, England was Margaret Thatcher, why did they want to ensure that Jamaica did not further embrace democratic socialism? Because all of this went against globalization in the form of international trade and the spread of multinational corporations and by extension, foreign direct investment. Because most of the multinational corporations, especially of war, after World War II, were heavily concentrated in America. And my, this is just my own, I've always said this, that America, even a company that is, even a company that is American owned, it is not just economic, it's also cultural in that they want to indoctrinate 
um, people into believing that America is this big savior. So during the 1980s, um, the New World Order was what is called neoliberalism. And let me write that term in the neoliberalism. Please ensure you write down this term. Or some people just call it free market capitalism. Um, this kind of ideology was running throughout the world after World War II, um, especially in the 1980s. And as a result, the Caribbean countries had to now open their economies. So Mr. Siago said, here what? We're not interested in owning in democratic socialism. We're, we're interested in free market capitalism. And as a result, Caribbean countries now um, started joining the World Trade Organization. And again, multinational corporations started setting up shop in the Caribbean. And it would be interesting to, to see somebody look at the, the, the origins or the history of multinational corporations in the Caribbean, um, as well as from direct, direct investments. The last mention on globalization is that, and I'll say that globalization is the integration of people, economies, cultures, politics, and techniques or political systems. So globalization, I'm gonna put in the chat. And this is integration of people's economies cultures, and technologies. I'm sure you guys heard about the killing of Haiti's, Haiti Prime Minister. Haiti's Prime Minister. Anybody heard about it? Yes, sir. It's been all over the news for a month. Right. And it's a sad state of affairs, but I can tell you that some people say it's a well-deserved death because what he was trying to do was try, he was trying to pull off a Russia, a Russian um, global, uh, globalization. What, you know, what the Russian president did, making yourself um, prime minister in perpetuity. In other words, you're going to be prime minister forever. And somebody said, nah, that ain't gonna work, my brother. We're gonna take you out. And I'm not celebrating his death. I'm just saying, in terms of our discussion, um, how these things somewhat manifest or play out. All right. So, and you 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 have what are called types of globalization: economic globalization, cultural globalization, political globalization, financial globalization. And I've sent you some documents that you can read about these particular things. All right. Um, remember that for your presentation, it has to be. Your presentation has to be um, rich with credible sources. Now I want to turn my discussion to, let me say, foreign direct investment. Give me one second. Hello, you guys are hearing me? Sure, sir, are, will you be sending the recordings? The recordings, are you, you, this is your first class? My second class and I was part of the last class. I was not able to be in. I had to come out of the second part of the class. All right, all the recordings are uploaded to my YouTube channel for you to read, okay? For you to um, listen to. Your YouTube channel, okay. And when I say my YouTube channel, it means the my work related email is used to create the channel and you go there and you just listen, all right, and watch the recording. And I will know for persons who go there or not because analytics is there. It tells me every time somebody goes there and actually who goes there. So I suggest you go there. Um, and this is for everybody you now, and constantly pay attention to the information. So now we go to a, a discussion about foreign direct investment. I, I was wondering, we did talk about multinational corporations, but let me spend a 
on foreign direct investment. So the first thing I want you to, to, to think about in terms of foreign direct, foreign direct investment is the, it is really the international flow of capital. So that's one way of thinking about um, foreign direct investment. It is the international flow of capital and that it involves a degree of control usually between um, 10 to 20, 10 to 25 percent of ownership of a company in another country. In other words, for it to be considered foreign direct investment, there is some degree of control and there's some level of ownership. And based on the percentage of ownership, um, it will be determined uh, as foreign direct investment. And foreign means that the investment is coming from a country other than the host country, in other words. So you might find that companies in America, whether it be multinational corporations, um, and we have many of them in Jamaica, foreign direct investment, you have Burger King, KFC, you know, all of these companies that have directly invested in Jamaica and that they have managerial control um, and or ownership. You found too that again, World War II becomes very fundamental in the conversation about foreign direct investment because there was a rapid growth of foreign direct investment after World War II. And again, it makes sense after World War II because it was during that period of time that there was the proliferation of um, international bodies that were developed to facilitate international trade. And we did mention some, um, the, 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 the more important one being the World Trade Organization. So the, right after World War II, there was a rapid growth of foreign direct investment. And, and that in and of itself would suggest the integration of economies um, and the movement of capital uh, and movement of technologies and peoples across um, international borders. Another point I wanted to think about in terms of foreign direct investment is that globalization in its many manifestations is the reason for the long-term growth in foreign direct investments around the world. And again, it goes back to the international bodies that have been created to facilitate such a process. There is a kind of, some people say, uneven or unequal relationship between where the capital is coming from and where it is going. So the capital usually comes from developed countries such as United States, Canada, United Kingdom, or Europe. Not in all instances, but primarily from those countries into developing countries that have serious economic challenges. Sometimes they do have resources, but they just don't have the technology or the, or the means to benefit from those resources. You found too that the embrace of neoliberalism or free market capitalism between in the late 80s into the 90s led to a proliferation again of foreign direct investment. You also must note that the development in, when was the internet, can you Google and tell me, when did, was, when was the internet quote unquote discovered or created? And who was president of the United States at the time? Please, you can Google. Because all of these things are coming to the fore So I'm seeing January 1st, 1983. Okay, January 1st, 1983. All right, does it tell you about the country or anything like that? 
checking for that as well. Okay. Not seeing it? Not yet, sir. Internet not really fast. Okay. But it was it was in the United States. Um and that again facilitated what they call information communication technologies gave rise again or created easier routes for companies to expand overseas. And I'm going to share a, 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 a slide to get a little bit more specific in terms of foreign direct investment. Let me just go to the beginning. All right. Share screen. And then I probably will spend a little time on, if time permits, slide share from the beginning. You're seeing my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. So, what is foreign direct investment? Um, it occurs when a firm invests directly in new facilities to produce and or market in a foreign country. Once a firm undertakes foreign direct, foreign direct investment, it becomes a multinational enterprise. So now we see the nexus between a multinational corporation and FDI. So if you're looking at the history of any of them, then of course you have to talk about almost all of them. Because once the firm does the foreign direct investment, it is now functioning as a multinational um, corporation or multinational enterprise. And multinational means that it transcends national borders. It's operating outside of its host home country. And there are two types of FDI. And the, the one that we're really focusing on, I find primarily, is the acquisition or merging with an existing firm in the foreign country. A greenfield investment where the establishment of a wholly new operation in a foreign country is usually unlikely because it's very cost, very costly. It happens, but not always. So there are two ways to look at FDI. The flow of it, of the amount undertaken over a given period of time, and the stock of it, to the, um, which is really the total accumulated value of foreign assets at a given time. So you're looking at the outflows or the flows of FDI out of a country. So how many multinational corporations or how many firms inside of Jamaica are investing in a foreign country and how many countries outside of Jamaica or how many firms outside of Jamaica are investing in Jamaica. Can you think of any multinational enterprise that is Jamaican owned and created? Grace, sir, Grace. We have Grace. Can you think of any other one? Sir, what about Captain's Baker, sir? Where else do we see Captain Bakery? Captain's Bakery. I think they're in Cayman, to in sir. Okay, I'm not sure that they function as. I don't know. That I would consider them to be a multinational corporation. They actually, still around. I don't know whether they're still around. Can you think of any other example? What about Lasco? So you know, I just said I said that. Yes. Just said I said that. Yeah, man, Lasco. Put the word. Can you think of any other? Is it the 
bank some of the banks or more or banks are or banking sector um don't we have some of them overseas NCB. which countries do we find ncb i've never seen one in canada and i i'm almost sure they're in the us i'm almost sure they're in the us when i was living in the us for a brief period of time i I remember somebody told me that I could go to NCB because at the time I joined NCB. But I think Grace and Lasco are the two more prominent ones that come to mind. I, I can't think of any other either. So it's very important that to, 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 to pay attention to the outflows of FDI as well as the inflows of FDI. I'm not going to go through all of this because really what I want you to understand is more the history than the going to have, there's an entire section on the course of line about FDI. Sir, best dress, sir, best dress. Best dress, yes. Yeah, I think they opened one a facility in America. Um, I think it was last year, sir, to um to bring the chicken there so they don't have to export it. Right. So they actually raise the chicken in America now. Okay. Someone was saying something. Someone else was saying something. Sir, Mega Mart is one of them as well. Where else do we see Mega Mart? Baltimore, USA. All right. So, so they're in Baltimore. I wonder why they're in Baltimore. I guess there are a lot of Jamaicans living there. I guess. All right. Um, some of these things, I don't want to get too... All right, so this is where I wanted to go. So since World War II, the U.S. has been the largest source country for foreign direct investment. Again, you see that. And, and now you see partly why America would be pushing Jamaica and invading Grenada to get rid of democratic socialism because they want their, the firms in America to invest in other countries. And sometimes when these firms invest in these other countries, they... they, they and this is just my argument based on my own education when I did international. I actually did my degree in international relations and literature in English. Some of those companies are literally spying on people. To, it, this is just so. Yes, you might have a, a, um, you might have an American brand um, setting up shop in Jamaica or in other parts of the world, but I'm sure the CIA will say, okay, let's just use your company as a way to probably spy on this or whatever. That's just my speculation. I could be wrong. But knowing America, I don't think I'm wrong. That's usually how they operate. Um, so other important source countries include, and notice these are all are European. So the, the, the only non-European country is Japan. And J Japan has emerged as a very strong economy. And I'm not sure if you know the history of Japan. When Japan and the United States were at war, and the United States drop, dropped an atomic bomb. And at the time, Japan was focusing um, a lot on um, their military. So they wanted to become a military superpower. After they realized that they could not beat the United States, they shifted from, from military to economic. And this is partly why Japan is doing so well in terms of foreign direct investment. Um, and as it says here, these countries also predominate in rankings of the world's largest multinational corporations. There's a point that was made earlier that I wanted to understand. Uh, all right. So this, so in the last, there has been a shift towards FDI in services. No, it was this. And again, you hear the liberalization of policies governing FDI in services. Um, Again, it goes back to the, the to the to the neoliberalism that I spoke about, or the liberal um, free market capitalism that gave rise to foreign direct investment, and it is that it is really the multinational corporations that are actually doing the foreign direct investments. Um, the majority of cross-border investment involves mergers and acquisitions rather than greenfield investments. As I said before, greenfield is too expensive, so they prefer to just merge. Or, or acquire an existing company. So firms prefer to acquire existing assets because mergers and acquisitions are quicker to execute than greenfield investments. And I'm not going to get into that because that's not really the, the focus of this. Uh, the shift to service, to the service industry. A lot of economies have become service industries. Um, Jamaica heavily depends on service industry in terms of tourism, for example. 
we're becoming a very service-driven um, economy. So the shift, the shift to services is being driven by the general moving many developed countries towards services, uh, again, the liberalization of policies, and I'll go again. And then of advantages of foreign direct investment, you guys can look at that. I'm not going to get into this discussion about these particular things. The cost and benefits and all of that, those things, you, we will actually discuss them in, uh, as we progress. We will discuss these things. The, the last thing I want to discuss no, his is the history of multinational corporations. All right. Any questions, guys? Are you understanding? Are you understanding? We are very silent. Are we understanding? Hello? Yes, sir. All right, just okay. checking, just making sure that you guys are understanding. Did I have a PowerPoint on this one? Mm, that's fine, direct investment. Mm, let's see. Okay. All right, to some extent, I have something on multinational corporations. All right, so the history of multinational corporations. Again, we go all the way back to the 18th to 19th century. So ensure you had, your, your heading is history of multinational corporations. So we go back to the 18th to 19th centuries where um, there existed multinational corporations um, in Europe and the United States and that they grew in might and power and influence after the demise of the Soviet Union. And that before the 17th century, before the 18th century, in the 17th century, they were granted special privileges and they were not really called multinational corporations, they were really called corporations. And that they too participated in colonization and mercantilism and that they were really extensions of governments and monarchs. And that but in the 18th century, America really developed their own multinational corporations. And multinational corporations prior to the 18th century were so, was somewhat government owned or government influenced. But by the 18th century, especially in America, they were now privately held entity for profit making and played a significant role during times of wars, um, whether it be the American Civil War, World War I, or World War II. And I'm going to share a slide that somewhat speaks a little bit about, further gives additional information about multinational corporations. And I'm deliberately doing this because I know some persons have their presentation and I want you to do a very good job. So what are multinational corporations? Firms that actively control operations in two or more countries. They, direct, they have direct control over foreign affiliates or subsidiaries. Um, and again, they talk about foreign direct investments, all right? Uh, and I'm sure we can think of many examples of multinational corporations and ExxonMobil Exxon is an example. The world's largest publicly traded company headed or, or is headquartered in Texas and has uh, and operates throughout the world. Um, why are we interested in multinational corporations? because they provide an understanding for us in terms of globalization or economic globalization, um, international trade and the integration of economies and how they to um, affect foreign direct investment. This is talking about you know, key, key sites of tension between national political systems and a transnational economy. And there will always be tensions because you'll find that some of the multinational corporations some of them they don't want to pay taxes or they want tax holidays for like 10 years and when they make their millions or their billions they the, the money is repatriated um to their home country and the money is not reinvested in the host country so they have those kinds of things that are happening in with uh, multinational corporations so there's a lot of tension in those countries uh, in the caribbean in the 1980s um they came more more than 1990s a lot of multinational corporations came into the caribbean it was have you ever heard this term i want you to look this term up industrialization industrialization by 
meditation. Can somebody just look that up for me? It's in the chat and tell me what you are seeing. Industrialization by invitation and what is it about? Anybody? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So it's an industrialization by invitation. It's basically a strategy that was um, uh, pronounced by William Arthur Lewis. So basically what it says, sir, is like um, the guest country a foreign guest by the host nation to manufacture in its space, just like that of Puerto Rican bootstrap. So basically, it look like um, you invite somebody else to come in your country, come do some for Not a person. Guess. Not a person. Yeah, uh, multinational corporation, I guess. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is something that I, I would really, really wanted to spend some time because you can talk about it in relation to multinational corporations within the context of the Caribbean. Um, what really happened is that at the time when we got our independence, many countries after you no know, to, to facilitate economic development, they invited many multinational corporations in the Caribbean um, to set up shop, give them tax free holidays like 10 to some 10 15 20 years what really what really happened and that that was because they were supposed to employ people and transfer technology and, and, and knowledge and all these things but what really happened is that they suckered the caribbean we never really benefited because the profits that were made were sent back home and they they they, they didn't allow um workers to unionize do you notice that persons who work like at like like at fast foods they, there's no union to protect them i wonder if you guys realize that that is part of the way how quote unquote got signed out, sign away their rights. Um, most multinational corporations that operate in the world, they have that clause to, that prevents their workers from unionizing because they don't they want to pay them at a certain level and they want to be able to dismiss them at any time and things like that. And this is why I say to people, you need to find a profession, not a job. And the two are not the same. Some people have a job, some people have a profession. All right, so it's a, it's a, it's a very um, interesting thing to look up. All right, let's recap. I think I gave you a lot to digest. What are some of the things we discuss? I'm missing everybody. Hello, what are some of the things we discuss? Why are we silent? Hello? What are some of the things we discuss, guys? Are we still there? Christopher, Jerome, Kayla, Mario, Nisha, Rachel, Ramon, Shanique, Wayne. What are some of the things we covered today? All right. Have a good evening, everybody. I have another class, so I'm going to save my voice for the remaining minutes for my other class, okay?